President Bush led the world tributes to Mrs. Thatcher. I'll miss her, he said. She was an outstanding ally. His White House predecessor, Ronald Reagan, said he'd always been able to count on her warm support and loyal friendship. President Gorbachev's foreign ministry spokesman said she was an historic figure who helped bring the Soviet Union closer to Europe. Mr. Bush made his comments as he celebrated America's Thanksgiving Day with his troops in Saudi Arabia. President Bush was on a helicopter tour of Allied bases in the Saudi desert at the time his closest ally in the Gulf crisis was announcing her intention to step down. The president, who has repeatedly praised Mrs. Thatcher for her leading role in the alliance against Saddam Hussein, interrupted his visit to American and British forces to pay this tribute. I think everybody in America would agree that Margaret Thatcher has been an outstanding ally for the United States. And I, you know, I'm, I'm certain that this will continue uh, with the United Kingdom. But on a personal basis, uh, uh, I'll miss her because I value her counsel. I value her long experience, the, the wisdom that comes from her long experience. And she has been an outstanding prime minister for the United Kingdom and an outstanding friend of the United States. The commander of Britain's famous Desert Rats believes a change of prime minister will not alter the role of his soldiers. No, I think that's extremely unlikely. Plans have been made. And I would be very, very surprised if anything alters at all. I think we're totally committed to this now, and quite rightly so, too. President Bush left the Saudi desert this evening, no doubt reassured by the announcement that 14,000 more British troops will be heading out to the Gulf next year. Paul Davis, News at 10, Saudi Arabia. Here, of the three men now competing to succeed Mrs. Thatcher, Mr. Heseltine has been in the Commons longest. Caring capitalism is what he campaigns for. The Foreign Secretary, Mr. Hurd, is said to have the safest pair of hands in the Conservative Party. The Chancellor, Mr. Major, did not quarrel with the description of him as economically dry, socially wet. Michael Heseltine's hope, as he posed for the cameras last weekend, was that his bravery in challenging the Prime Minister would see him to victory, starting an unstoppable bandwagon. His fear, he'll now be seen as incapable of uniting the party. It was as an Oxford undergraduate 35 years ago that he plotted his path to Downing Street by the 1990s. From presidency of the Oxford Union, he made and lost a fortune in property development, came back with a publishing empire and showed an early taste for publicity, interviewing the then Miss World. When you actually were walking in front of the judges, you were, first of all you had an unusual swimsuit on, but did you have any other sort of tactics? No. He joined the cabinet as environment minister in 1979, 13 years after entering parliament. His urban renewal schemes following the inner city riots were early evidence of his developing philosophy of caring capitalism. With his blonde locks and rousing speeches, he quickly established a reputation as the darling of the Tory conference. And our inner cities are just a signpost of a journey of despair. As Defence Secretary, his frequent appearances in flak jackets were all part of his tough image. It was he who introduced cruise missiles to Britain. An incident, he says, was exaggerated when he swung the mace in the House of Commons, raised doubts over his temperament. There were yet more when he stalked out of the Cabinet over the Westland affair. But that was the result of a fundamental split between Mr Hasseltine and Mrs Thatcher over the issue of Europe. Since then, he's tirelessly toured the country, wooing the constituencies in his calculated campaign for the leadership. His agenda now is markedly different from that of Mrs Thatcher on the three major issues dividing the cabinet. He favours a steady move towards a single European currency. He's for a single European bank, but he's not a federalist. He's been a consistent poll tax opponent and wants a wholesale review of the tax, along with a local government review. On the economy, he wants to see closer business and government links improved infrastructure and increased spending on education. His aides still say he can win the leadership contest. Well, there are many people who said their loyalty to, was to Mrs. Thatcher in the first round, but they wanted to see Michael succeed her. That's why I'm confident that our vote will grow. There were others who said perfectly honestly that they were voting uh, for Michael Heseltine because they couldn't support Mrs. Thatcher, but they would prefer one of the other two candidates that's now stood. So there's going to be some transfers going both ways. Some supporters might think again. But I must look very carefully indeed at what John Major and Douglas Hurt have to offer. But they will have to go far to match up to the already marvellous manifesto put forward by Michael Hasseltine, which was the reason that I backed him. But it is popularity with the electorate that remains Michael Hasseltine's best asset. 
Jackie Ashley, ITN, Westminster. Conducting diplomacy over champagne at the opera this summer, Douglas Hurd seemed a man who'd achieved what he desired and was enjoying the fruits of his success. His public comments suggested he wanted no more, but his supporters have told him he's the man to unite the party. From my knowledge of him, having worked very closely with him in a number of crises, he is one of those people who, the more pressure you put on him, the better he is. And he will also unite the party, which is a crucial factor at the moment. He's the son and grandson of Tory MPs, an Etonian, this picture was taken after the Eton Wall game, and at Cambridge he won a first and was president of the union. The background of a Tory patrician of the old school. He delayed into public life while he reared a family and built a career as a diplomat. It was then that he began writing political thrillers. His co-author was Andrew Osman. In all the time I've known him, I've never heard him once say that he wanted to be prime minister. Never. I think I might have heard him say that he'd rather not <laughs> once or twice. It was Edward Heath who brought him into politics. After working with Mr Heath at number 10, he won his seat in Oxfordshire in 1974. That Heathite past may have delayed his entry into the Thatcher cabinet, but when he finally joined it as Northern Ireland secretary, he impressed her by the way he negotiated the Anglo-Irish agreement. A year later, he was rewarded with promotion to the Home Office. It was a time of inner city tension and rioting. In Birmingham, he experienced it firsthand. His tough response then may reassure some on the right of the party now. It is not poverty which leads people to burn down post offices, to loot television sets and video recorders, and to make vicious attacks on the public. The roots of these acts lie in greed and in the excitement of violence. On the decisive policy questions, his positions will worry some on the right. He's unashamedly pro-European, though he's had his share of arguments with Britain's partners. On the poll tax, he said it can be improved, but doesn't want the sort of immediate radical review envisaged by Michael Heseltine. He's never questioned the government's handling of the economy, but his writing suggests he might favour the more interventionist approach of the old paternalist Toryism. His views on Europe may be the greatest problem for the right. They are very close to those of Sir Geoffrey Howe, and if the resignation of one puts the other in Downing Street, it will be a real defeat for the anti-Europeans. But it's his handling of the Gulf crisis that most point to as evidence that he's the leader the party needs. I think he's excited widespread admiration, irrespective of party, for the very calm, steady and intelligent way uh, in which he's handled the British interests during this very real crisis. At 60, Douglas Hurd can claim to have the experience a Prime Minister needs behind him. But he's vulnerable to one charge from the John Major camp, he's never been involved in managing the economy. Hazard. In a political drama coloured by cricketing metaphors, it's appropriate that John Major should now be padding up. A genuine cricket fan, unlike Mrs Thatcher or Sir Geoffrey Howe, he took time off from his first budget preparations this year to launch a youth cricket appeal at the Oval. John Major is playing for the captaincy after just a few years in the first team. His rise has been rapid by any standards. John Major's background, in contrast to Douglas Hurd's, was humble. His father, a music hall trapeze artist, forming a double act with his mother, Drummond Major. He left school at 16 after showing early promise at cricket and worked as a building labourer. He was unemployed for a time before going into banking. He won the seat of Huntingdon for the Conservatives in 1979. Promotion was swift through the Whip's office and a minister's job at Social Security. Then the Cabinet in 1987 as Chief Secretary to the Treasury, working with Nigel Lawson as interest rates were cut. Later, he said this was a mistake which had fueled inflation. Last year, he had the astonishing breaks which propelled him into the limelight, first as Foreign Secretary, then just three months later, back to the Treasury, replacing Nigel Lawson. Here, John Major quickly established his own style, a listener and a conciliator, unlike his abrasive predecessor, a man who likes to be liked, preferring to eat in the Treasury canteen with his advisers to the usual round of Whitehall lunches. And he's played the Euro diplomacy game with relish. Mr Major has resolutely opposed the single currency, but has extended a British hand of friendship to the Europeans. To their delight, he persuaded Mrs Thatcher to drop her opposition to the exchange rate mechanism. 
So he is pro-European, but not on any terms, and is against the Delors plan. He has followed the government line on poll tax, and while being a free marketeer, he takes a liberal line on social issues. His political stall was laid out at last month's party conference, much to the approval of the Prime Minister. Excellent. Terrific. Very, very good indeed. Oh, he's definitely a future leader. He had it with him today. We might see him as Prime Minister one day. Did he think it was the speech of a future leader? The speech of a present Chancellor. One day, perhaps? There's no vacancy and won't be for a long time ahead, I hope. But now he really is on the threshold, with powerful voices tonight in support. John has an excellent uh, chance, and uh, I very much believe he's going to win. My conclusion is that the best candidate, by far, is John Major. His Huntingdon constituents would say aye to that as they celebrate tonight. John Major, a meritocrat, a man of the people, their man for Prime Minister. Mrs Thatcher's refusal to compromise over her political beliefs was her hallmark in government. It won her support in the party and in the country. But when in time it was seen as a refusal to listen to colleagues, it began to stir discontent. Margaret Thatcher's time at number 10 was marked by three fundamentals. Her total conviction, in public at least, that her policies were absolutely right. The tough measures that this government has had to introduce are the very minimum needed for us to win through. I will not change just to court popularity. That it took her strong leadership and her carrying the can, as she once put it, to see them through. So let the storm clouds swirl. Before us a shining future is within our reach. Let us have the spirit and, yes, the sheer guts to press on and grasp it. Seared into her political soul was the failure of the Heath government in the early 70s. Ted Heath made Margaret Thatcher a minister. But Margaret Thatcher came to despise Ted Heath's consensus politics and, above all, what she regarded as his U-turn on the handling of the economy. In opposition, and soon as party leader, tutored above all by Keith Joseph, she began to work for a Conservative government based on conviction, not consensus politics, to the point where, at her second party conference as Prime Minister, she gave notice of her way of doing things. To those waiting with bated breath for that favourite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> the ladies, not for turning. <laughs> Words became deeds in Geoffrey Howe's 1981 budget. At a time when almost every piece of popular advice called for a reflationary budget, it was draconian in its deflationary severity. On inflation, where the goal was always zero, there was an immediate fall to below 4% by mid-83. But the effect on unemployment was equally staggering. The figure topped 3.2 million during 1986. Parts of Britain's industrial heartland simply disappeared. 200 economists wrote to Mrs Thatcher to denounce her policies. But by 1987, fighting for a third term in office, Mrs Thatcher was declaring her pride in her economic achievements. With inflation under control, she declared, and with the economy on the mend, the taking of tough decisions and of sticking to them despite short-term unpopularity was the highest political virtue. Of course, there was some luck too. Margaret Thatcher's fight against inflation coincided with the fight against the Argentinian invaders of the Falklands. The defense of a few small but British islands in the South Atlantic struck a chord of national pride. There is a white flag flying over Stanley. <laughs> Bloody marvelous. <laughs> Other policies struck an equally deep national core. For example, Mrs. Thatcher put individual home ownership at the centre of her philosophy. In 1979, renting was still a way of life. Only 55% of people were owner-occupiers. With the introduction of the right to buy council homes and easier mortgages in the 80s, another 3 million joined the ranks of homeowners. With the right to buy went the encouragement of popular capitalism. Another policy, the onslaught against trade union power, also caught the popular mood. And all of that, the ability to judge and deliver on people's popular aspirations or people's greed, as the Labour Party claimed, 
That led to election victory for a third time in 1987, and with another huge majority too. Yet within a short time, the third Thatcher administration was in deep political trouble. So, what went wrong? For a time after the 87 election, all seemed well. The economy raced ahead, house prices soared. But after the sudden collapse in share prices on so-called Black Monday, Nigel Lawson feared a recession. And it was the corrective action which he took then, which just happened to combine with that other great and continuing bone of contention in the Conservative Party, Europe, which led to a rapid decline in Margaret Thatcher's fortunes. The problems of the economy had combined with the split over Europe to produce the resignation of a man who was once one of Mrs. Thatcher's most valuable political allies. But she had another major problem to deal with soon. The introduction of the poll tax in England and Wales produced widespread unrest, with council meetings disrupted as local authorities met to set the charges, and with serious and violent rioting up and down the country. In the end, though, it wasn't the poll tax which was to be Mrs. Thatcher's undoing, but the continuing rifts over Europe. The decision to join the ERM had two immediate results. In Britain, it reopened the classic split over Europe within the Tory party. And at a special emergency summit of the European community in Rome, originally called to discuss other subjects, it emboldened the other 11 member countries of the European community to try and bounce Mrs. Thatcher into agreeing to full economic and monetary union, single currency, European Central Bank and all. Mrs. Thatcher was outraged. She let fly, first in Rome. She was as forthright two days later in the House of Commons on the related issue of greater powers for the European institutions as proposed by the European Commission. Of course, the chairman or the president of the commission, Mr. Delors, said at press conference the other day that he wanted the European Parliament to be the democratic body of the community. He wanted the commission to be the executive and he wanted the Council of Ministers to be the Senate. No, no, no. That outburst and plenty more like it pleased some Tories. Her best parliamentary performance for months, they said. And Mrs. Thatcher was right to stick up for Britain. But as with similar outbursts over the years, it left many pro-European Tories in despair, and it made Sir Geoffrey Howe resign. Now the die was cast. The ferocity of Sir Geoffrey Howe's attack and months of trailing in the opinion polls raised once again the question of how Mrs. Thatcher was running the government. Questions about her leadership on every issue, not just on the issue of Europe, came bursting through to the point where Michael Heseltine, the challenger in waiting for so long, decided finally that he had to make his move. Coming next, the young politician who said a woman couldn't become Prime Minister and how she did. That's in a couple of minutes. Evil speaking. Commissioner Drabholz office. Modern technology can make a fool out of anyone. And the new Sony E-Series Trinitron is no exception. Because with three separate speakers and Nikam digital stereo, the sound is so good, it's hard to tell which is the TV and which is the real thing. Sony, why compromise? Try boots for this lot. <laughs> Just what I'm looking for. 
Mustn't forget the aftershave. Something for the ladies. Mmm, very professional. I wouldn't mind that myself. Now, let's see. Mmm, they look tasty. The kids will love you. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's the blooming lot. Whoops, now I'm for it. Oi, I've got something for you. And I've got something for you too, my dear. <laughs> from Boots. <laughs> There's a Christmas present for everybody at Boots. <coughs> a dose of even the most effective cough medicine will only work for a few hours. So Beecham have developed cough caps, a capsule that gives up to eight hours relief. That can mean a complete night's sleep or a cough-free working day without making you drowsy. Beecham cough caps, up to eight hours cough relief day or night. Mrs. Armstrong, surgery three. Oh, Mrs. Collins, I'm sorry, but Dr. Hutton is running a bit late this morning. I could try and make you another appointment. No, I'd rather wait, thanks. Okay. Mr. and Mrs. Collins know who they trust with their son's health. Mrs. Collins, your turn. They know who they trust with the important things in life. Hello, Dominic. Who do they choose to advise them about their money, their pensions, insurance, investments? The only top ten building society that's free to give independent advice. Bradford and Bingley.